Hello everyone and welcome to the Valvoline 4Q 2023 Earnings Conference Call and Webcast. My name is Emily and I'll be coordinating your call today. After the presentation, there will be the opportunity for any questions which you can ask by pressing start, followed by the number one on your telephone keypads. I will now turn the call over to our host, Elizabeth Russell. Please go ahead, Elizabeth. Thanks. Good morning and welcome to Valvoline's fourth quarter fiscal 2023 conference call and webcast. This morning, at approximately 7 a.m. Eastern Time, Valvoline released results for the fiscal year and fourth quarter ended September 30th, 2023. This presentation should be viewed in conjunction with that earnings release, a copy of which is available on our Investor Relations website at investors.valvoline.com. Please note that these results are preliminary until we file our Form 10-K with the Securities and Exchange Commission. On this morning's call is Lori Fleece, our President and CEO, and Mary Marshallsberger, our CFO. As shown on slide two, any of our remarks today that are not statements of historical facts are forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements are based on current assumptions as of the date of this presentation and are subject to certain risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from such statements. Babbling assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements unless required by law. In this presentation and in our remarks, we will be discussing the results on an adjusted, non-GAAP basis unless otherwise noted. Non-GAAP results are adjusted for key items which are unusual, non-operational, or restructuring in nature. We believe this approach enhances the understanding of our ongoing business. A reconciliation of our adjusted non-GAAP results to amounts reported under GAAP and a discussion of management's use of non-GAAP and key business measures is included in the presentation appendix. The information provided is used by our management and may not be comparable to similar measures used by other companies. As a reminder, the retail services business represents the company's continuing operations and the former global product segment is classified as discontinued operations for the purposes of GAAP report. On slide three, you'll see the agenda for today's call. We'll begin by discussing our best-in-class retail services platform and proven formula for growth. We will then look at a review of our financial results and guidance. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to Lori. Thanks, Elizabeth, and great to be with you all today. Fiscal 2023 was a transformational year for Valvoline, as it was our first year as a peer play retail business. In addition to delivering the expected results for the year, we completed the sale of global products and made substantial progress on our promise to return the sale proceeds to shareholders, with $1.5 billion in share repurchases this year. With both a strong results track record and a clear strategy, our retail services platform is well positioned for long-term growth. Valvoline is the quick, easy, trusted leader in automotive preventive maintenance and also is a best-in-class retail services provider. We have a proven track record of growth. Fiscal year 2023 marked our 17th consecutive year of positive same-store sales, with system-wide sales growing to $2.8 billion. Our network of 1,852 stores is over 50% franchised, and Valvoline has been named the top franchisor in our category by both Entrepreneur and Franchise Times. We also have a proven track record of strong profit and returns with mid-teens IRR and EBITDA margin growing to 26.3% for the year. As we've laid out previously, Valvoline offers a best-in-class value proposition to investors based on growth, brand, and performance. With a 150-year-old brand and a scaled platform of over 1,850 locations, Valvoline is a proven leader that has created significant revenue and EBITDA growth in recent years through store additions, same-store sales growth, and accretive M&A. The market we serve is large and non-discretionary, with an estimated $470 million do-it-for-me oil changes 
performed annually in the United States. While we've delivered an 18% compound annual growth rate in our system-wide sales since the IPO, Valvoline still has significant opportunity to build upon our estimated 5% market share. We have confidence in our ability to grow to 3,500 plus stores while lowering our capital requirements through accelerated franchise growth. Our model of quick, easy, trusted service will allow us to continue winning market share and generate attractive returns and significant cash flows in the years to come. This creates an incredible value proposition for investors. Slide 8 shows our key metric performance over recent years, demonstrating our strong history of financial performance, including fiscal year 2023. With 137 stores added in 2023, including 51 franchise stores, our total store count is now 1,852. System-wide sales grew to about $2.8 billion in 2023, an impressive 18% compound annual growth rate from our IPO in 2016. System-wide same-store sales also saw strong and consistent growth across the network with 11.9% growth for both company and franchise systems in 2023. And from a profit perspective, adjusted EBITDA grew 20% to $380 million in fiscal 2023, resulting in a 32% compound annual growth rate since 2020. Turning to slide nine, you can see our full year FY23 results along with our FY23 guidance and long-term guidance we provided last year. Valvoline delivered strong growth across all metrics. Not only did we deliver against our fiscal 23 guidance, our performance was aligned with our long-term algorithm across all metrics as well. In addition to strong sales and store growth, our EBITDA growth outpaced the top line sales growth, capturing leverage across the business and improving margins to 26.3% for the year. For FY23, we saw 62% growth in adjusted EPS to $1.18 which was significantly impacted for the year by items related to the sale of global products, including share count reductions due to share repurchases and interest income from the investment of the net proceeds. Mary will discuss the FY24 guidance in more detail in a moment, but we do anticipate fiscal year 2024 results to fall within our long-term algorithm guidance as well. Turning to slide 11. We have a simple but highly effective formula for delivering long-term value to our shareholders. I first shared our three-pillar strategy last year, which includes one, driving the full potential of our existing business, two, accelerating network growth, and three, expanding services to meet the needs of an evolving customer race and car park. This proven formula will drive higher revenue, strong margins, free cash flow, an attractive return on invested capital. Let's take a look at each of those in more detail, starting with the potential in the core business. As you can see in slide 12, we've seen significant operational improvements in recent years. Our marketing sophistication continues to be a standout in the automotive services industry. We continue to build brand awareness and optimize the cost to acquire new customers. Our quick, easy, trusted service consistently delivers a strong customer experience and drives customer retention. Our average ticket continues to increase, demonstrating our pricing power, as well as strong execution of non-oil change revenue service penetration and premiumization. As we see costs increase, notably in product and labor, we take pricing actions, which we have already done in FY24. We do this with confidence in our pricing power as we continue to look for but not see trade downs or service deferrals at this time. Our growth in customers and ticket drive for wall e profitability improvement. This can be seen in our mature store performance and we anticipate an additional 70 million of EBITDA as current non-mature stores mature. Next. Let's look at an update on new units. 
As I mentioned earlier, we finished the year with a strong delivery of store additions, bringing our new store additions for the year to 137. After a challenging Q3, our franchise partners delivered 26 total units in Q4. We mentioned in Q3 that we expected some of the delayed units in Q3 to push into Q4 or Q1, but our franchise partners were able to deliver most of the delayed units in Q4. We also had a record number of new builds for the year for both company and franchise systems with 47 and 24 units respectively, with nearly 50% of the new units being new builds. This demonstrates that our franchisees see the value in continuing to take advantage of both M&A and ground up opportunities. While we expect the challenges we saw in Q3 in construction and permitting continue, our company and franchise teams are finding new ways of partnering to improve processes across the development cycle. For example, in fiscal 2023, Valvoline formed a development council which includes our corporate real estate and developing franchise partners across the system. Our development council is highly engaged and focused on pipeline execution strategies, capital reduction plans, and reinvestments into the business. As we turn to slide 14, I'm proud of our progress toward accelerating network growth. Both our team and our franchise partners recognize the significant opportunity we have to expand our store footprint. Auto care remains a growing, highly fragmented market with significant white space for expansion. As we set out in FY22, we see potential to grow our retail system to over 3,500 units. We continue to target 250 units, new units per year by 2027, with 150 coming from franchise. We see multiple levers to fuel new growth, including partnering with our existing franchisees, adding new franchise partners, which we continue to pursue, and opportunistic M&A. We anticipate taking a step towards that goal with the projected 140 to 170 total unit additions for fiscal 24 with 55 to 70 coming from additional franchise units, largely from our existing partners. On slide 15, we turn to the third pillar of our strategy, customer and service expansion. Today, I'd like to highlight our progress in the fleet business and non-oil change revenue service penetration. Currently, fleet is less than 10% of our total system-wide business and continues to grow at a faster rate than the consumer business. In fiscal 23, the fleet business saw 25% sales growth as we added over 3,000 new accounts and increased our business within existing accounts. The fleet business ticket averages about 20% higher than the average consumer ticket based on company store performance. This is largely driven by the fleet owners taking advantage of the non-oil change services we offer in order to maintain their important business assets. For fleet customers, our proposition is compelling. The quick, easy, trusted service is not only convenient, but it helps fleet owners keep their vehicles safe and on the road. We're excited about the progress of the business and the growth potential it offers. Now let's take a look at non-oil change revenue across the system. The growth in the fleet service business is certainly a contributor to our improvements in non-oil change revenue service penetration but we're also seeing that improvement within our consumer base. The system-wide non-oil change revenue has grown consistently with an increase of $1.93 this year, our largest dollar increase in four years. For company stores, about half of this was driven by service penetration, which was enabled by an increase in training and new tools deployed to increase the consistency of our presentation of these services, as well as ensuring a quick, easy, trusted delivery. Now I'll turn it over to Mary to discuss our financial results. Thanks, Lori. Let's start with a look at our revenue growth. We saw significant sales growth for both Q4 and fiscal 23. For the quarter, sales grew 16.3% to $390 million, and for the year, we saw growth of almost 17% to $1.4 billion. System-wide, same-store sales grew 10% for the quarter, with approximately two-thirds driven by ticket and one-third from transaction growth. 
For the year, system-wide same-store sales grew 11.9%, with approximately 70% driven by ticket. Ticket growth in the quarter and the year was largely driven by pricing, but we also saw meaningful contributions from non-oil change revenue, service penetration, and premiumization. On the transaction side, growth in customers was the largest contributor. The convenient and trusted service we are providing to our customers continues to drive this strong customer retention. On slide 18, we have a look at margin performance. Year over year for the quarter, EBITDA margin increased 190 basis points to 28%, driven primarily by improved labor efficiencies along with lubricant cost declines that were largely offset by waste oil headwinds. Sequentially, margin rate decreased 130 basis points, which is largely driven by seasonally higher benefits expense within the labor line. As Lori mentioned for the fiscal year, we saw EBITDA growth of 20%, outpacing the 17% top-line growth. EBITDA margin improved as well, increasing 50 basis points to 26.3%, largely driven by SG&A leverage. Turning to slide 19, you'll see additional financial results for the quarter and the year. Adjusted EBITDA improved 24.8% to $109 million for the quarter, and 20% to 380 million for the year. We also saw strong growth in adjusted EPS with 39 cents for the quarter, an 86% improvement over the prior year, and $1.18 for the year, an increase of 62%, both driven by stronger operating results, higher interest income, and share repurchase activity. Turning to slide 20, we have an updated look at the balance sheet and cash position. We continue to make progress on our commitment to return a substantial amount of the proceeds of the global product sale to shareholders. In fiscal 23, we returned $1.5 billion to shareholders. During the month of October, we repurchased an additional 2.8 million shares, leaving $124 million on the current $1.6 billion authorization as of October 31st. We continue to have a strong cash position and still anticipate the completion of the current authorization in the coming months. Our target leverage ratio remains 2.5 to 3.5 times EBITDA on a rating agency adjusted basis, which translates to 1.5 to 2.5 times from a non-rating agency adjusted basis. Cash flows from operating activity increased $219 million over the prior year to $353 million. As we mentioned earlier in the year, this includes favorable changes in networking capital due to the one-time benefit of the growth in payables as a result of the new supply agreement with Global Products. This quarter, we once again saw favorable interest income from the investments of the net proceeds from the sale of Global Products, earning $11 million for the quarter and bringing the total to $44 million for the year. On slide 21, we have our guidance for fiscal year 24. As Lori mentioned, we expect fiscal year 24 to be an on-algorithm year. Top-line revenues are expected to grow to $1.6 to $1.7 billion, driven by expected same-store sales growth of 6 to 9% in store additions of 140 to 170, with 55 to 70 stores from franchisees. From a profit perspective, we expect EBITDA to grow to 420 to 460 million. As a reminder, with seasonality around customer driving patterns and the timing of our annual company meetings, we expect just over 40% of EBITDA to come in the first half of the year, with the balance coming in the back half. Capital expenditures are expected to be 185 to 215 million which includes amounts for additional new company store growth, increased maintenance, and technology costs. We expect adjusted EPS to be $1.40 to $1.65. Now I'll turn it back over to Lori to wrap up. Thanks, Mary. I want to thank our talented team of over 10,000 and our strong franchise partners for the hard work that delivered these results in fiscal year 2023. We continue to deliver best-in-class performance relative to high-growth retail peers. 
We're focused on creating shareholder value with our long-term algorithm of driving the full potential of our core business, accelerating network growth with a focus on franchise, and innovating to meet the needs of an evolving car park. Now I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth to begin the Q&A session. Thanks, Lori. Before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone to limit your question to one in a follow-up so that we can get to everyone in the line. With that, can the operator please open the line? Thank you. If you would like to ask a question today, please do so now by pressing start, followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind and would like to be removed from the queue, that is start, followed by two. When preparing to ask your question, please ensure that your device and your microphone are unmuted locally. Our first question today comes from the line of Daniel Imbro with Stevens Inc. Please go ahead, Daniel, your line is open. Yeah, hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking our questions. Good morning, Daniel. We're going to be starting on the unit growth side. Good morning. Uh, starting on the unit growth side, obviously franchise openings caught up a bit. How, how do you feel about the pipeline and cadence for 24, and, and maybe how are the conversations going with potential new franchisees and the refranchising discussion you guys talked about last quarter? Yeah, great, great question, Daniel. <clears throat> we were really pleased with the progress in Q4. Obviously, Q1 was a, a surprise and a disappointment um, based on the push-outs we saw. But given some very quick actions that we took um, to support our franchisees and helping them uh, put, put stores up and get them running, uh, given supply chain and permitting challenges, we felt really good about where we landed in Q4, as did our franchise partners. And we had an opportunity uh, two weeks ago to actually meet with our franchise partners. We have an annual workshop with them. Um, <clears throat> and in that, we had a development council where we had our real estate and construction leadership and the, the leaders of the developing franchise partners all you know, come together and talk about FY24 and beyond. And I would say there is significant excitement about the opportunities in the market, um, both on the M&A side and on the new build side. I mean, this market is still very fragmented. Um, and while Valvoline as a brand um, is the market leader in the space, we only have 5% market share which means that there's incredible white space to develop our footprint. Um, and so in working with the franchise partners, um, as we've stated, we have a goal of getting to 250 new units per year uh, developed by 2027 and 150 of those coming from our franchise partners. Now within the 150, uh, about two-thirds will come from our existing partners. So that meeting that we had two weeks ago was really reinforcing on both sides about how we'll work together to get to that. And so we, we feel good about the pipeline. Our franchisees, we have franchisees asking for some expansion of their territories. We have active uh, development agreement updates uh, underway. And so we feel really strong about the guide that we have laid out for FY24 of 140 to 170 new units with 55 to 70 coming in from franchise. And we expect the franchise piece to continue to build year over year um, from our existing players as a big component of that 150 total target. And Lori, I would just comment that the um, comparison that we you made in your early comments was really against Q3, where we only saw one franchise unit, um, um, and so we felt really good about where Q4 came in with 26 new franchise units. Um, I would also say um, we've seen uh, progress in speaking with um, um, potential new franchisees. Uh, we really only want a handful of those um, that are capable of um, really driving meaningful growth. Um, we've seen the addition of a couple smaller um, new franchisees and are making good progress in discussions uh, with other franchisees as well as making some progress in um, talking uh, with uh, new franchisees on the refranchising side. So 
Uh, we're making good progress. Nothing, nothing specific to report on this call, but uh, progress is being made on all fronts. Great. Mr. Mary, for a follow-up, maybe just one on the guidance. Feels like a very algo-type guide in line with historical ranges. Can you maybe talk about what kind of comp momentum you're carrying into this year and what, you know, puts and takes we get you to the high or low end from here of the comp guide? And then a clarifier on EPS, does that exclude any buyback activity this year? I, I didn't see any clarifier in the release. Thanks. Sure. Well, on the second part of your question on EPS, um, it inc the EPS – guide uh, includes uh, the completion of the 1.6 uh, billion authorization, but doesn't include any additional uh, share repurchase um, authorizations that we might do uh, over and beyond the 1.6 billion. Um, on the first part of your question, I feel really confident about the guide for the new year. Um, um, we're seeing um, good performance coming into the first quarter. Um, and uh, we're um, uh, well positioned, uh, both in terms of you know the operating side of the business. Um, um, you know, I'm especially excited about the fact that our SG&A growth continues to be in just uh, mid to high single digits, while we're seeing you know sales and um, uh, growth um, in the mid in the mid teens, and we're going to continue to see nice um, margin leverage. Um, coming from um, the delta between um, that sales growth and the slower slower growth on the SG&A side. So, so um, um, good confidence and guidance. Lori, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. No, I would, I would add the same. I think um, the teams are really energized around opportunities to both grow cars in our existing stores and drive tickets. And uh, our franchise partners and and we on the company operating side both feel like we're going into FY24 with really strong momentum. Yeah, I would also add we saw some very modest leverage from lubricant costs in the fourth quarter. Um, well, um, it, it was about uh, 10 basis points from a sequential quarter perspective of benefit from lower lubricant costs overall, which is the you know the the. The product costs net of the waste oil um, um, sales, um, and so I, I think going forward in into the new year, we're well positioned. Um, we take a you know we, we we watch the cost carefully, both on product and our our largest cost in our uh, cost of goods sold is our labor cost, um, and we've already taken some price increases um, to begin fiscal year 24. But we'll continue to watch that carefully as as the year moves on. Uh, if we see any uh, necessary adjustments uh, within with, with, within the the cost um, areas that might uh, require some additional pricing increase, and you know I, we feel pretty good about our pricing power and ability to make those adjustments. All righty, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for the color and best of luck. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stephen Zacone with City. Please go ahead, Stephen. Your line is open. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I wanted to follow up on the prior question around uh, same-store sales. I was curious on the cadence of the year, how you're thinking about that relative to the full-year guidance you gave. And then within that, how should we think about the mixture of ticket versus transaction? Do you think you're at a point with pricing stabilizing in the industry? Great question, Stephen. I think as we looked at Q4, we, uh, and as, a, as, as we move into FY24, you know, we felt we, we finished very strong at 10% same store sales growth. Um, as expected, September was slightly lower than the rest of the quarter because we lapped a pricing increase that we did year over year. Um, but I, I think overall we we delivered the quarter as we would expect. Now, as we moved into the new year, at the October, uh, the start of October was a little soft, um, but that was relative to a very strong compare year over year. Um, and as we moved through October, we saw the momentum year over year uh, start to increase, and we feel really good about um, where our guide is and getting. Uh, having a six to nine year percent same source sales across the board, 
um, you know, across the business for the year. So I think the guidance is, is very good. Um, there's always, you know, we're working to hit, you know, as high in the guidance as we can, and that comes from initiatives that we have around continuing to focus on non oil change revenue presentation. Uh, we have some marketing optimization to drive uh, new new customer acquisition um, at a lower, you know, uh, CAC rate. Um, and then we have a bunch of initiatives around the fleet to get higher penetration of existing accounts. And as those things start to come, then obviously the same store sales growth will be stronger. But we feel really good about where we're coming into the year and how the teams have uh, gone after the business so far. Okay, and then just on the, um, just to clarify, I should ask it more clearly, just in terms of the cadence, is it also first half, second half, or do you think, you know, could the first half be a bit above that range, or are you within the second half, just on that ticket or some transaction? Yeah, so in terms of the overall same store sales, um, we, we actually see a fair amount of um, consistency in the first half versus second half. Um, uh, and so um, I do expect um, that we'll still see a little bit stronger amount of the comp coming from ticket versus transactions this year, uh, but it'll be certainly more balanced than what we saw in fiscal 23. Okay, great. And then just a second question I have is just on cap allocation. So when you're completed this authorization, what's the willingness to, you know, continue to buy back stock? How do you think about you know, that as a priority for, um, you know, your overall cash flow? Yeah, well, we've, we've, we've made a commitment to turn excess capital, return excess capital to shareholders. So as our EBITDA grows and as uh, we uh, manage through our target leverage ratio, of that two and a half to three and a half times rating agencies adjusted leverage ratio, I expect that we will see continued returns of capital to shareholders over time. Um, the business uh, will continue to generate strong free cash flow. Um, and again, with growing EBITDA, I don't expect us to allow the balance sheet uh, to get uh, lazy. And I, I, I do think that we should see um, continued um, returns of capital over time. I, I, I think we will re evaluate that subject to market conditions, um, you know, after we complete the current uh, re, uh, authorization. Um, and so I think you should expect to hear more about what our plans are with, with our next earnings call on um, um, Q1. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the detail. Best of luck this year. Thank you. Our next question comes from Simeon Gitman with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, Mary, one of your answers preempted uh, this question I was going to ask. Surprise, surprise on base oils and the gross margin outlook. So, so you kind of suggested that product costs have already come in. I'm curious, you know, how that's embedded into the guidance. And then if those expectations change at all uh, as you actually move through the fourth quarter. Yeah, well, you know, typically, um, Simeon, we, we, we take what we know today um, and reflect that in the guidance. So to the extent that we see base oil increases that ultimately would flow through to um, um, lubricant cost increases under our supply agreement, um, um, uh, that's not factored in. We're, we're, we're really factoring in. And, and the same goes for base oil reductions. If we saw incremental base oil reductions from where we are today, that opportunity is not factored in either. Um, we did do some math to try to help you better understand the impact of, um, um, so if there was a dollar increase in base oils, it would take about a 50% increase in price on the company side. 50 cents. So I'm sorry, 50 cent increase. Excuse me. Uh, for a dollar increase in base oils, it would take about a 50 cent increase in price to be able to cover that cost increase. Um, you know, said a little differently, about a dollar increase in base oil cost would impact unfavorably gross margins by about 50 basis points, and that 50 points, basis points would be made up with about a 50 percent increase in prices. Now, that's just on the company side of the business. On the franchise side of the business, we pass through base oil costs. Um, lubricant costs on a quarterly basis under our contracts with the franchisees. 
Okay, and then I'm going to ask a follow-up, and then with the second question in it, when you mentioned that the, the product costs got better, and you mentioned both, you know, the waste oil, is it that the underlying base oil got better, or the waste, or both? And then the, the completely separate question is: Can you talk about promotional in the promotional environment? What's happening? Is um, you know the higher prices that you're getting? in the marketplace they're sticking, but are they being call it funded by promotions? Can you talk about that overall? So um, our waste oil contracts are tied to um, base oil indexes. So um, when we saw a, modestly, a modest improvement in the quarter, um, it, we, it was a modest improvement on, on both ends um, because they're, they're kind of integrally tied contractually. Um, Lori, do you want to talk about the promotional? Sure, Simeon. Um, we're actually seeing um, we see pockets of, of discounting happening by competitors, but it hasn't actually changed our overall approach. And when we look at our retention rate for new to file customers, that's customers who've never been to a VIOC location, um, we have not seen any difference in retention rates. Um, over last year, and we don't expect to in the coming year. We actually have initiatives to try to increase retention by just addressing some of the, the feedback around our process for new customers. Um, in fact, if we look at FY23, we've been doing a lot of work to optimize our marketing spend and really get more almost personalization approach to discounts that are offered. And our year-over-year -year, uh, discount has come down, um, even in an environment where I think, you know, people are concerned about the resiliency of the customer. We're just getting smarter around what discounts are required for which type of customer based on the channel that we're acquiring from. Um, but on the promotional side, you know, we're not seeing any deterioration on the retention of a new-to-file customer or the active customer base. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kate McShane with Goldman Sachs. Kate, please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, we wondered if we could ask first um, what the average age of vehicles are that are coming to Valvoline, and just given what we've seen uh, at the dealerships with affordability headwinds, are you seeing any change in the age of cars coming in? You know, the average age of vehicles that we see, our, our, our sweet spot, Kate, is really between um, right around three years when cars come off a warranty um, uh, up to about um, 12 years. So the average age of a vehicle that we see is kind of in the mid eight year uh, um, range, and that really um, we haven't seen any significant change in that um, um, in the quarter. So, um, you know, I would tell you that um, our consumer um, is continuing to show um, the um, demonstrate their need for this kind of non discretionary service and maintaining their vehicles, um, and um, we we continue to. Um, uh, to like the spot that we see. Uh, we do think there's opportunities for us to take some more share from dealerships um, because our um, process is very convenient. So um, over time, uh, will we see that um, entry spot come down from that kind of three-year point? I think there's real opportunity for us there as we continue to market and really uh, drive the point of how convenient our service is. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll just add, Kate, that um, the the, the sweet spot or the highest percentage of penetration of the car park is between years six and nine of vehicle life. But that said, the average age of the vehicle uh, this year, this past year that came in relative to the year before was 10 months older. Um, so we are seeing people keep their cars longer. We know that, that's data that's out in the market, and that has actually uh, also been consistent with our customer's vehicle age. Um, but the level of penetration is the highest in years six through about ten, um, and then and then it continues to expand out as customers keep their cars. I do I do agree with Mary. Um, 
you know, we have been expecting the dealers uh, to start to use oil changes or preventive maintenance as a way to bring people back in um, uh, to, to look for cars. I think with the automotive strike that they may have held off on that just given where supply is, but that's, you know, our assumption because we're not, we're not seeing it at this time. We may see pockets of it in a specific market, but we're not actually seeing uh, those kind of dynamics happening from a customer retention or acquisition standpoint. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Our next question comes from Brett Jordan with Jeffries. Please go ahead, Brett, your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning, I think Brett. In your prepared remarks when you talked about your recent uh, good morning. When you talked about your recent franchise committee meeting, you mentioned capital reduction plans. Could you give us more color on that? And is it is it sort of a way to make franchise acquisition more achievable or I guess the back the backstory on that? Actually, great question. Thanks for asking it. <clears throat> um, as with all retailers these past couple of years, construction costs have been going up because of inflation, both on the uh, GC la labor side, um, just given the tightness, uh, but just in terms of material costs have been going up. And so we as a company, in trying to make sure that we're maximizing our return on capital invested, are looking at ways to reduce the capital costs of new builds um, in order to ensure that we continue to deliver really attractive return on invested capital, which we have been doing despite the, the increase in capital costs for new builds. Um, we've taken an opportunity to and hire uh, an A&E firm to relook at our drawings from uh, with a fresh perspective to actually figure out where we can take capital costs out of our design. Um, and we're early on in that process. We've gotten back some initial, uh, some initial results. We've engaged our franchise partners two weeks ago on some of those initial results. And we'll be taking some of the new designs to the market to bid out. And this is really just trying to get ahead of uh, continued cost inflation and how can we bring down the capital cost. Um, this is something that we've done proactively. We haven't done it because our franchise partners have asked us to or because they're delaying any new builds. In fact, as I mentioned, the pipeline of new builds on the franchise side is higher than it's ever been. And the reason why is because when you look at a fresh retail site that is in the right location, given traffic and population density, the amount of traffic that then you can gain with an optimized marketing spend is very attractive from a cash on cash return, although it does take more time to build up to that uh, than buying an existing site and converting it. So we're just getting ahead of trying to make sure that we drive, you know, the highest return on invested capital. Um, we, we continue to do that uh, and exceed by a significant amount our cost of capital but we're always looking for ways uh, to cut that down. One example I've used is we build out the ceiling in our stores, um, but nobody gets out of their cars, so why do we need to have a completed ceiling? That's just extra cost, which is not, ne not necessary. And so those are just the, the things that we're looking at. Um, our design hasn't changed in many, many years, and uh, it's just an opportunity to take a fresh perspective. And Lori, yeah, I, I want to go back real quickly. Sort of might link to that. No, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Simeon. If you had follow, if you had more on that prior question, that's great. Uh, the the follow up question, I guess, would be tied to that. In the in the what you're seeing in the non oil change services attachment, I guess you're talking about more business with the fleet. Is that more of the same service, or are you finding new services to add? And as you look at a new store format, is there the possibility of maybe another bay to provide services other than a pit oil change system? Um, the the non oil change revenue um, increases that we've seen. I mentioned a dollar ninety three um, in fiscal year twenty three, which was our highest growth in dollars for non oil change revenue services, is really focused on the services that we provide. And so we, we started the year just going through a, do we have the supply and the equipment 
and is the equipment all in working order such that um, the services can be provided for any customer whose vehicle requires them. The second is, is our team trained in those services to provide a quick, easy, trusted service delivery of those items, of those services? And then the third was how do we present the services to the customers such that the customer understands why their vehicle needs it and our proposition on doing them relative to others in the marketplace? And it's really just a going back to basics to make sure that our team is equipped and trained and can communicate what the customer requires based on the age or the functioning of the vehicle as it presents itself to our stores. Um, we are and always look at adding additional services. And we do see opportunities, but we have to make sure that A, they fit our proposition of quick, easy, trusted, um, B, that we can we can train our team to do them um, effectively and efficiently, um, and then make sure that we understand the requirements from a capital perspective. But we're always looking for ways to expand our reach. And you know, when as we talk to fleet managers, they're really you know leading some of that discussion or helping us evaluate because they they love the one-stop shop nature. And the more that we can do in our stores in a quick, easy, trusted way, um, you know, that, that's a, been a good discussion point and us validating where we should focus. But we don't have anything to report at this time. Um, we'll obviously give updates and, um, and share more as we have it. Great. Thank you. So, Lori, I just wanted to go back and clarify um, a comment I made earlier. Um, the average age of a vehicle we serve, um, I mentioned eight to nine years. That's actually the time where, where we over-index the most to the car park. The actual a average age of a vehicle we serve is a little bit lower than the average age in the car park at 11 years versus the car park being at about 12 and a half years. So I, I misspoke a little earlier and wanted to correct that. Our next question comes from David Lance with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hey, good morning and thanks for taking my questions. So SGNA management was impressive in the quarter. Can you talk about some of the, of the moving pieces in that line and, and how you expect that to look as we move through fiscal 24? Yeah, so um, we did see really nice leverage year over year um, that was largely driven by SGNA management. Um, we saw 190 basis points of EBITDA margin improvement uh, year over year for the quarter, of which three, three fourths was related to the SGNA leverage, and about a, a quarter of it was related to gross profit leverage, where we saw some good labor efficiencies year over year in the quarter. Um, I would tell you that there's a lot of time and attention being paid on the SGNA line. We know that um, um, we're investing in the business. Um, to um, uh, maintain our higher growth rate, and that does require um, some investment in SGNA. But we think that there's um, a real opportunity from an efficiency perspective to be able to scale as well. So a lot of focus in those, that area, and um, a, a lot of time and attention being paid paid in that process, especially with you know our new, our new plan in place our, and our guidance for the coming year. Uh, we expect to continue to see leverage in the on the SGNA line. Got it. That's helpful. And then on the fleet business, it's less than 10% of system wide sales today, but growing really strongly at 25%. So curious how you're thinking about one the long term penetration, and then two how that you know sales growth rate could look through the next year. Yeah, it's, the one thing I'd I'd just set context on is our market share of the fleet business is, I think, less than 1% or around 1%. Um, and our overall market share in, in the oil change space is about 5%. So we see significant opportunity just to get our fleet penetration or share up to where we are overall as a market. Um, we, we haven't we haven't shared what our growth rate is on the fleet side, but we expect that it will continue to outpace our overall growth um, because we are having, you know, fantastic discussions with our 
with, our, with the fleet management companies as well as with small fleet operators. Um, in this past year, we actually expend, expanded some of our fleet work to cover our franchise partners. So when you look at growth in fleet overall, um, fleet of our company stores is, is a much stronger um, you know, growth rate, but it is, I think on the fleet side, we'll start to see that accelerate. And the less than 10% was on a system-wide basis. So again, we see a lot of opportunity on fleet um, and we're trying to make sure that we can enable our franchisees to get the benefit of the work we've been doing for the company-operated stores. And Lori, I'd add that one of the biggest requests we get from our um, national fleet customers is an expanded footprint. Um, you know, we currently are not in certain locations where they would like us to be, and so um, continuing to expand that footprint will act as a tailwind to our growth in the fleet business as well. Absolutely. Great, thanks. Our next question comes from Mike Harrison with Seaport Research Partners. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hi, good morning. Uh, Laura, you mentioned morning, uh, earlier that you are uh, undertaking some efforts this year to optimize your marketing efforts and, and work to improve retention. was just hoping you could talk in a little bit more detail about uh, what some of those uh, optimization actions are. Um, and also, uh, do you expect to see marketing spend uh, be pretty similar to where it was last year, or is it moving higher year on year? I'll let Mary talk about the marketing spend overall, but in terms of our efforts, it's around, we look at new store marketing, so some of our marketing spend is tied around uh, the number of stores that we're launching and where those stores are. Obviously, we've mentioned before that we're trying to focus our, our, uh, our new store entry in key markets where we're, where we're infilling the market and therefore marketing costs would be lower than a market that is, is much less penetrated or new and therefore requires a lot more brand building. But some of the optimi optimization we're doing both for company and for franchise is around new store marketing and what are the most effective tactics given the penetration and the brand that already exists so that we get a faster ramp um, on new store sales. Second is some of the tactics that we're doing on how to reactivate customers who are inactive. And by inactive, it just means that they haven't come to us within the last 12 months and we want to find ways to re-engage them and we ran a number of pilots last year on how to do that, doing things like a Father's Day promotion for inactive customers. Those are days where our volume is, tends to be lower than, than what our capacity would be. And so if we can market to inactive customers to come in on days that are, are not as busy, one, they're going to get a great experience. The speed is going to be fantastic, and it's a chance to reengage a customer uh, before they before they defect. Um, the other thing is really optimizing um, the channels that we go after new customers and doing that in a more surgical way based on our store base. Um, so we have stores that have been in market for you know 20 years and the demographics around those stores are not growing at the same pace than other stores and making sure that we're spending new customer acquisition dollars in areas that are growing and, and that we are maybe less mature in the marketplace. So these are taking the dollars that we have, both in reminding existing customers, you know, that they need to get another oil change uh, given the time that we last saw them, but also optimizing our new customer acquisition so that our cost of customer acquisition is down on a per customer basis. Um, the last one is we just continue to, to look at new digital channels and digital tools. You know, we've had a robust marketing and, and CRM, you know, backbone um, relative to our industry. It's, it really is a standout. But when you compare the things that we have done relative to what uh, broader retail is doing on the digital side, we still see there's opportunities for us to be 
more effective and more efficient on the marketing side. But Mary, do you want to comment on yeah. marketing spend expectations? Yeah, so overall, um, marketing as a component of SG&A for the new year will be growing in line with new store count growth for our company stores. Um, so, you know, expect it to be pretty consistent with, uh, you know, a high single-digit SG&A growth um, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we will see growth in um, marketing, um, but it'll be pretty much in line with, with, with store growth, uh, which is the dr primary driver of the increases in marketing spend. A lot of what Lori talked about is uh, driving efficiencies in our existing marketing spend. Um, um, so overall, um, I'd say that we're likely seeing a, a high single-digit increase in, in uh, marketing for the year, for the new year. All right, that's very helpful. And then a, a couple of housekeeping questions, Mary. Uh, first of all, can you help us understand a little bit what drove that DNA number uh, to move up uh, so much sequentially yep. to that $28 million sure. level? Uh, did, did you expect yeah. that, and, and can you give us maybe some some guidance for DNA expense as well as interest expense next year? Yeah, we, we certainly expected some of it. Um, about 25% of the increase related to just new stores coming online. 75% was related to new technology that was placed in service. Now, a component of that, um, probably about half of it, uh, was some catch-up from the prior quarters. Uh, where we had placed technology in service earlier in the year and didn't get uh, the depreciation captured in the quarter. Um, but um, I would tell you that moving forward, we'll continue to see increases in uh, depreciation and amortization related to new stores, um, kind of consistent with where we saw it um, um, in the four quarters of this year. But um, I expect to see modestly higher depreciation and amortization moving forward as we make more technology investments to, to drive improved experience and more efficiencies in the stores. So I think um, um, the quarter, fourth quarter itself was a bit unusual because we had some of that catch up. Um, but um, going forward, you, you'll likely see a little bit higher uh, growth rate uh, because some of the new technology investments that we're making. Sorry, and, and interest expense uh, for next year? Yeah, so interest expense, I, I think if you look at our interest income um, um, in the current year, we had $44 million of interest income that offset interest expense. Um, um, and so, um, you know, we, we still have $757 million at year end of cash, and cash, cash equivalents and short-term investments. Um, we'll see some of that go away um, given market conditions um, um, with the tender for the 2030 bonds um, that I would expect sometime in our second fiscal quarter. Um, 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 so um, you'll, you'll continue to see a little bit elevated uh, or benefit to interest income in the current year um, given um, our, our cash position. Uh, but once we um, net through that, I think you'll um, start to see a more normalized um, interest expense um, based on the outstanding uh, 2031 bonds that are just under 4% discount rate, excuse me, interest rate, and the um, term loan A, uh, which has a variable rate based on, on SOFR plus a spread. So, um, you know, I think we're, we're in good shape. I will tell you that we built in a little bit of cushion in our guidance, our EPS guidance, assuming that we're going to see the Fed move interest rates uh, another um, uh, 100 basis points or so. Um, and so that is built into our EPS guidance. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. And with that, we have no further questions, so I'll turn the call back to Laurie for any closing comments. Uh, thanks, Emily. <clears throat> and thank you all for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. Uh, since our last update, I've enjoyed spending time with many of you and our investors, and I look forward to the ongoing discussions. We have a resilient and durable business, and I am excited about the momentum that we're taking into FY24. Uh, so I appreciate your time today. Thanks.
Thank you everyone for joining us today. This concludes our call and you may now disconnect your lines.